How's that look? That looks perfect. Take it away. Wow, we're just ready to roll, huh? We are ready. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, it's really exciting to have this event, even though unfortunately we can't be in person. This is just so great to see so much participation though. And thank you, Lori, for doing all the work that you're doing to make this thing smooth for everybody. Um, I'll dive right in. And well, I guess I'll say before I dive in, there are two things I just wanna set up as an expectation here. The first is that um, the first word in my title is evaluating seed mixes. Um, but throughout the talk, I'm gonna use evaluation and, and designing seed mixes kind of interchangeably. I think it's really the same skill set, and it's just a matter of where you're coming in and if you feel the confidence to design mixes for yourself, or if you wanna use the skills I'm gonna present here to just evaluate mixes that are hand mixes that are being offered. Um, the other thing I wanna just say is that I'm primarily going to cover seed mix design for what I would call open systems. So in that way, it's mix or open systems for me are systems like prairies, grasslands, wetlands, systems that have less than 25% canopy cover. So just so you know what you're getting into. Um, I will not say a lot about Xerxes. Hopefully you know a lot about us now after day three. Um, but I will say one thing here. And that is a big thank you to any of you who are members in our audience. Um, we couldn't do this work without you. We are a member-based organization. We um, rely on you to do this collective conservation work. So thank you. Uh, and then I'll say just a little bit about my particular position. Uh, I am funded by uh, a partnership between General Mills, the Xerces Society, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So that's the NRCS, that's the, the branch of the USDA that's responsible for helping farmers with conservation. So in that role, um, I provide free technical support to farmers and landowners who um, are considering pollinator habitat, who want some assessment, uh, want help with design, um, and then I also help conservation staff who work for NRCS or soil and water conservation districts, anybody who's kind of interacting with farm bill conservation programs. So I put this out there. I'm in southeastern Minnesota in Cannon Falls, but I, I cover ground in Minnesota and in Wisconsin. And so I put this out there for those of you who may fall into one of those categories and would like some support. I'm here for you. Um, and also if you're joining us from elsewhere in the upper Midwest, I have counterparts, counter partner biologists um, who I could get you in touch with. Okay, I'll start here and I promise this will be the only depressing slide <laughs> in my entire talk. And um, and honestly, I, I don't even think of it, it all as depressing though. So we're all here gathering because we know there are these big issues with invertebrate declines, um, there are these major drivers of the declines like habitat change that we're seeing all around us, loss and degradation. There's just ubiquitous <laughs> use of pollution and, and pesticides. And then we're also facing severe kind of climate change consequences. And so knowing that, you know, we're all here trying to think about practical solutions. And so I would like to kind of spin some of this information, you know, knowing what the drivers are, knowing how it's affecting pollinators to come up with really informed solutions for seed mixes. So knowing that the pollinators that are most likely to be in decline are Lepidoptera, or at least butterflies and moths we know more about because we've studied them more. Um, we know that certain species of bumblebees are in decline. We know that specialist bees are more likely to be in decline bees that have um, short activity periods, so those that are only flying for a, a short window are more likely to be decli in decline, and then bees that um, are associated with rare plants or declining plant species, of course, are more likely to be in decline. So with that knowledge, we can really be strategic about starting new habitat from scratch or managing habitat to kind of uh, meet some of those concerns. So 
since this is evaluating mixes for pollinators, um, I figure we should kind of center these animals for a moment, learn about them, kind of understand what their needs are, if those are the organisms for which we're trying to conserve and create habitat, right? So full transparency here, when I'm designing pollinator mixes, I'm also thinking about all these other invertebrates that are gonna come along um, and kind of make the system more multifunctional. So even though these sort of center six groups of animals like butterflies, flies, moths, wasps, beetles, and bees are what we would typically consider pollinators. There are also these really important beneficial insects like lace wings and assassin bugs, fireflies, spiders are just examples of some that are also using this habitat. They're using the flowers actually. They're using some of those floral resources. Um, and they, they need this habitat just as much. They need the refuge for it. They need the supplemental nutrition. Um, and so I'm thinking about all those animals when I'm designing seed mixes. But I am gonna focus on bees for just a couple slides here. They are the most um, important pollinators because they're actually carrying pollen around. Um, there's this amazing diversity of bees out there. You've probably even seen this slide before. Um, I won't go into all the details here, but just to focus your eyes on a couple details. The, in the center, you know, you can see 3,600 species. That's approximately how many species we have in the United States. Um, they're coming from all these different bee families. Some of them have different um, life history traits, like some of them are ground nesting, some of them nest in cavities, some of them parasitize each other. There's just fascinating diversity here. And I've circled the honeybees and the bumblebee category because they're so overrepresented in our mind, like images of pollinator conservation, but they, in terms of the richness out there, they're really just a small sliver of our diversity. So since I'm a really visual person, this is the kind of thing that helps me understand like what's actually happening out there in, the, in our prairie landscapes, right? So we have these bees, they need certain things, they need food, they need um, shelter. This is one way to think about their morphology and the diversity among them. So I'm, what I'm showing you here are different bee tongue lengths. And yes, I know there is a moth in here as well, showing you the tongue there as well. Um, and you can see there's a lot of variation. So some of them have really short tongues relative to their body size. Some of them have really long tongues. And these are, of course, adaptations to work with different kinds of flowers where nectar is either um, a little more restricted or right at the kind of, um, it's really accessible. You can even see that Kalides up on the top right has sort of a bifurcated tongue. It's really cool to think about them interacting with flowers when you can see their tongue. And of course, this is to primarily drink nectar, so carbohydrates for fuel. Um, but they also need pollen. Pollen is kind of like their protein. Um, this is primarily what they're feeding their babies. Um, and you can see here a lot of diversity too in their body morphology, the places that they're carrying pollen on their bodies. You can see a lot of diversity in the pollen itself. Some of it's pink, orange, yellow. They're carrying it kind of on their bellies or up in their armpits. Um, it's a little hard to see this, but I'm sure that the texture, the properties of the pollen are all very different. Um, and so this is just another way to be thinking about that really cool diversity. We need all these different bees out there. And if we want to attract all these different bees out there, we need to be putting all these different kinds of floral morphologies out there in our landscape as well. This is just um, a really small handful of inflorescences that might occur in our upper Midwest landscape. You can see some of them have, um, you know, like I was saying before, restricted access for nectar. Some of them have that nectar right on the surface, like the yarrow down on the bottom. Um, these are adaptations, cold kind of evolution with these bees, primarily bees, uh, but other pollinators as well. Um, so if we want that diversity of, if we want to effectively conserve the greatest diversity and abundance of bees and other pollinators, we need to really supply them with a diversity of food. But bees need, bees and mother pollinators need more than just food, they also need nesting habitat. And um, this can come in a variety of forms. That's a lot of bees are stem nesting, um, about approximately 30%. 
approximately 70 plus percent are ground nesting. Um, and then there's this small group like, like bumblebees that kind of nest all over the place. Um, what I really should have shown is like under bunch grasses, that's a really common place in prairie systems for bumblebees to nest. And an important place to nest for um, butterfly larvae or other kinds of invertebrates that we're trying to protect. So bees and pollinators need nesting habitat. So right, we've covered they need food, they need nesting habitat, and they also need protection from pesticides. Um, this might seem obvious, but it just has to be said when we're planning habitat and we're thinking about seed mixes, um, we should be putting that habitat in places where there's the least risk of pesticide drift. So we can mitigate for this, we can plan ahead, um, creating some spatial distance, um, spatial buffer between the planting and the known pesticide drift. Um, putting in, there's a lot of different ways to do this with um, conifers or trees or basically less desirable plants um, so that we're not kind of poisoning um, pollinators right next to the uh, pesticide concern. Communicate with landowners. This is just really key. <laughs> um, so just to, I know I went through that pretty fast, but to summarize, you know, there's three major habitat requirements for all of these pollinators. And I think it's really important to understand these so that we can build that knowledge in, and strategy into our seed mixes. So they need diverse vegetation for season long nectar, pollen, host plants. I think Sarah and Heather commented on how the majority of invertebrates out there have pretty close associations with host plants, whether it's a pollinator or some other kind of spittle bug, right? They, they need certain host plants. They need shelter for nesting, for overwintering, needs to be protected from disturbance, uh, and they need re refuge from pesticides. Um, so, I'm, so we've talked about the, the organisms that we're trying to protect. Now we can start talking about the actual seed mixes. And before really doing that seed mix part, that's the really fun part for me, we have to do this kind of preliminary work of stepping back and looking at the landscape in which you're trying to design a mix um, to figure out what already is there and then figure out, you know, are there deficiencies in that landscape? Are there things that we should be trying to um, address, deficiencies that we could prioritize in terms of improvements? This is just kind of common sense, but it really makes sense from, you know, an economic perspective as well as pollinator conservation perspective. So this is an illustration that helps um, demonstrate certain pollinator habitat features. I'm by no means saying that all of our habitats should look like this. Obviously, this is sort of a farm environment, but it's a way to visualize certain kinds of features. And if you have those features, one of the best things you can do is to conserve and kind of maintain, maintain those features um, rather than starting something from scratch. So if you have riparian areas with some of those really valuable native trees and shrubs that Heather talked about, um, if you have, especially if you have any remnant areas, remnant prairies, you know, we don't know how to put those back together yet. So protecting um, those is really an essential part of pollinator conservation. So this is, you know, when I'm thinking about different habitat features, this is, really helps me to visualize, you know, what, what might be missing in the landscape. Circe's has a few tools to help you actually quantify um, this process. So we call them pollinator habitat assessment forms and guides. The one I use the most since I primarily work with farmers is, is this one for, for agricultural landscapes, but we also have one for rangelands, for natural areas, there's one for beneficial insects, um, one for bumblebees, and recently we've developed one for urban habitats as well. And so it goes from like the landscape scale all the way down to site level and um, floral features, nesting features, management styles, um, things that you might be doing. And then you can kind of piece apart, you know, what is your score? Where are your deficiencies? Maybe I don't have enough nesting habitat. Maybe I'm um, low on spring blooming species. And with those results, you can plan habitat um, more strategically. So I really recommend 
exploring the surrounding landscape first. And then comes the fun part of actually getting to design your seed mix. So we'll get into that. Um, you have to, these are again, more prerequisites before you get to actually sit down and choose species. Um, you have to kind of develop your vision. So what are you trying to accomplish? Are you mainly just trying to cover the ground, like provide some vegetative cover, which might look something like the above photo on the top? Um, or are you trying to create like a pollinator paradise, which you might try to achieve something like on the lower picture? Um, you know, how long are you willing to take to make it happen? Is it something where you need it to happen really quickly because maybe you have a contract like in a year or less? Or do you have, you know, 10 years to make this happen in exactly the way that you want it to happen? You have to learn about the site conditions, the, these properties that are kind of fixed, like the landform, the, the topography, the soils there. Um, and then get on site too. figure out what is already there, what is the past vegetation, what, what's the pesticide history there in terms of herbicides and insecticides and even uh, fungicides. Um, those increasingly have really long carryover time, especially some of the agricultural pesticides or herbicides. So that's really critical to document, you know, what previous herbicide use was. Um, learn about the disturbance history, all of these factors will help you design a better seed mix, I, I promise you. Um, learning about, you know, even the shape of your restoration planting could have impacts on how you strategically design your mix, um, whether or not you really are going to have constant seed rain of invasive woody species, that kind of thing. Um, check for differences across the site. And then finally, I, I always put budget at the bottom. You know, I want you to do the, the visioning process first and then kind of reconcile all of it with the realities of your budget because we all have that reality to work with. So the, the first thing to do once you've chosen your site is get to know it. Um, and like I was saying, there's some fixed properties that you just have to, to work with and that's topography and soils. Um, I like to use web soil survey because it's a free service um, that provides pretty good maps. Um, not, as, not as beautiful as this one. This is not from Web Soil Survey, but Web Soil Survey does create beautiful maps. Um, they, and that, so you can group the, the map, or I mean the soil types by um, drainage class when you play around in Web Soil Survey. And that will help you figure out how many seed mixes you need. So um, this is a map that the DNR, Minnesota DNR created. Um, in partnership with some other organizations. And it's a large site, right? It's like something 500 something acres. Um, and so, you know, clearly they have this topography on there. They had to eventually create four different seed mixes because they had four different major drainage classes there. But it, this doesn't have to happen just on large sites. I think you could still go through the same process on a five or 10 acre site and determine that you need multiple seed mixes. Um, it's a better, more efficient way to use your money so that you're putting the right species in the right place. Um, and just, you're just going to have more success if you plan for species in the right soil types. And this, this is sort of a central premise of everything I'm going to talk about hereafter, is that diversity is key for seed mix design. Um, for pollinators, for, for everything, for climate resilience, for uh, greater functionality. There's so many processes that mediate diversity on a site that we don't have control over, like, um, like soil properties or the landscape context or even climate and agricultural legacies on a site. But when we design a seed mix, we, that is something we have control over and we can use it to benefit soil health, to benefit you know, water, quality. Um, the greater, the more diversity you put into the planting, the greater resistance it will have to plant invasion. It will establish quicker. Um, diversity is kind of like your panacea for, <laughs> for uh, restoration. Let's see here. Okay, and so I want to stop for a second to define my terms. So when I talk about diversity, I mean something kind of specific. So I'm going to 
guide you through a few terms on the right here. So when I talk about abundance, that's just the number of individuals of any species that are out there, right? And then richness in a plant community is how many species are present. So in these two plant communities that I have on the left, there's the same richness in each plant community. There's four species present. Um, but the evenness is really different between the two plant communities, right? So the evenness on the left is, well, it's pretty even. It's 25% of each species. Um, however, on the right, we only have one individual of the uh, spiderwort you know, it's really unbalanced, right? There's not evenness there. So when I'm talking about diversity and promoting diversity in your seed mixes, what I mean is a combination of not just, not just the species count, but also the evenness. I want richness and I want um, evenness among those species. So now we're finally approaching that, <laughs> that time where you actually get to start selecting species. Um, I'm going to talk about a few general principles and then we'll get down to the species level. So the first general principle is to select species that have habitat preferences that match your soil conditions. Um, I just like to put this table up because different nurseries or, or um, outlets will use different terminology. So when you're working with Web Soil Survey, um, or NRCS systems, you know, they're going to use this terminology of excessively drained or very poorly drained and so forth. Um, whereas when you're selecting species from a, a native uh, seed vendor, they're going to use different terminology, dry to wet um, and music and so forth. So this is sort of an equivalency table in case that's helpful for you. And again, choose species that are going to be most appropriate and most successful at your site for for your budget and just for, I don't know, for satisfaction. <laughs> so you, so you, um, you know, it works. Maybe goes without saying, but I have to say it as a general principle is that when we're trying to create pollinator habitat, we have to provide abundant flowers throughout the season from early spring to the fall, um, not just it's richness, it can't just be present, but it has to be in abundance, right? It has to be even um, because often I see mixes that have just this minuscule amount of spring blooming species in there, um, which might amount to, you know, one or two individuals per acre and then have this huge flush of blooms later in the season. And that's probably a very cost effective mix, but it's not a very good mix for pollinator conservation. Uh, we have to select species from different functional groups. And some of these might not be that intuitive for a prairie system like woody species. Uh, woody species do belong in prairie systems. Um, and, and grasses and sedges, so many prairie mixes tend to be heavy on these C4 warm season grasses. Um, but we really need all of these different kinds of what are called graminoids, so grasses and sedges. So cool season grasses, warm season grasses, sedges and rushes, even in upland settings. Um, for forbs, we need a diversity of species that provide um, different kind of life history strategies, species that do really well after disturbance, like annuals and biennials, but then we need things that are gonna hang on and be long-lived perennials. Um, we need some species that are, you know, hemiparasitic. That's a really um, important component of remnant prairies in, in at least Minnesota, I should say, tall grass prairies. Um, and we know that including this functional diversity in a planting um, allows the planting to establish quickly. It reduces its invasibility. Um, <laughs> it is, it, it's supposed to be invasibility, not invisibility. <laughs> um, and, and then, of course, it's uh, creates really uh, resilient plantings that really stand the test of time. And then this is sort of one of my favorite topics. We, we really need to select species from a variety of plant families. And this is to serve the generalists and the specialist bees out there. Um, Sarah and Heather already did a really great job of talking about some of these important plant families like asters, legumes, and willows for supporting some of the generalist, um, I mean, for some of the specialist bees. Um, 
there's another link to the Jared Fowler um, website that outlines all the different specialist bees in our region. It's go to it, go explore it. It's a really great resource. Um, and then I use another plant family here just as an example, as a sort of demonstration that, you know, um, Lysimachia, the genus, is a really important host plant for sort of rare bee, Macropus. These are oil collecting bees that use, they use the oil in these, in these flowers to line their, to their, their nest cells. Um, and, and it's actually a pretty common genus to find in, in remnant areas across the state, but it's almost never used in, in restorations that I see. So just to call to that, I'm gonna hang on the topic of plant families for a couple more slides, because it's, like I said, kind of a, a favorite topic of mine. Um, and I wanna talk about this one paper that came out in 2017 from Becky Barrick and others. Um, that restored tall grass, my toolbar is kind of, um, I actually can't read this, <laughs> the top of this because it's obscured by my toolbar, but basically restored prairies have less uh, plant family diversity than remnant prairies. And we've all seen prairie restorations that look kind of like that top picture, right? The one with the Menarda and the Rudbeckia. Um, and that's, that's okay. I mean, there, we already know that those are powerhouse plant species. There's a lot of specialists that go to those. Um, but when all of our restorations start to look the same, we, you know, maybe that's a problem. So overrepresented families in restorations tend to be the grasses, <laughs> um, asters, uh, legumes, and the mint family. So we see those in almost every restoration. But what we don't see in restorations are some of these missing families like the lilies, the orchids, um, some of the native bindweeds, honeysuckles, native chickweeds or campions, um, milkworts, uh, rose family is actually really broad, and some of them do, do get representation, um, and violets, you know, so these are plant families that are common to, um, to remnant prairies, but we really don't see them very often in in restorations. There's a lot of reasons for that because some of them, like orchids and lilies, you know, they might um, they might be protected by the state. So you can't move the plant material around very often. Even seeds, um, seeds might be very difficult to germinate. Um, maybe just don't know that much about how to propagate some of those species. And so they're not commercially available. Um, just something to kind of think about when you're designing mixes. Here's another list that I put together. It's not from that paper. Um, and this is just, you know, kind of handpicked some species that I know are ubiquitous across the upper Midwest. Um, they're common to remnant prairie systems, and yet they're not very represented in restorations. Um, I, I'm violating some PowerPoint rules here by putting a bunch of text on here for you. Um, but that's just a a handful of species here that we could be adding in at, um, at higher rates. Some of them were highlighted in previous talks throughout the last couple of days and how important they are. Some of them are easier to establish than others for sure. Um, but anyway, just to consider every single one of these additional species is adding a new plant family. And we know that when we add a new plant family, you're gonna attract some of those specialist invertebrates that would otherwise not be there. one more slide here. I just want to go back just so you don't get the impression that I'm speaking disparagingly of some of our common uh, species that do show up in our uh, restorations because they are important, right? So we have these huge plant families like the asters that have all these different genera. Some of them host so many different specialist bees and, and other kinds of pollinators. So don't skimp on those. Like don't don't be shy about adding those. We need those in our restorations, but just don't forget some of the other plant families that are also important for this overall goal of increasing pollinator uh, abundance and diversity. Okay. So now we've talked about these general principles for pollinator conservation in seed mix design. Um, now we finally get to get down to that level where we're, we're talking about species which species to put in the mix. Um, 
there are a few different tools I have, tools and resources I have listed here. This is, again, just a handful. There's so many other great resources out there. But what I would prioritize when identifying um, tools and resources are tools that offer range maps. So you can figure out, you know, based on your restoration site, which species would naturally occur in this area, might do well in these soils, uh, might be appropriate for this region, right? So on the right here, I have an example um, of a spider wart. And in Minnesota, we have three species that naturally occur in Minnesota. So um, there's, but one, you can see the, the Tradescantia brachiata on the right, um, that's the one that most often occurs in Minnesota. And that's the one that we should probably, depending on where you are in the state, should be putting in your seed mixes. Um, but you may have times when you, when you need a substitute. And so now you have to decide based on range maps and where you are, um, your goals, you know, could you substitute one of those other species or would that just not be appropriate? I'm gonna um, walk through a couple of these. I do wanna just point out the prairie moon um, tool, not because, you know, we're, um, this is not an endorsement of Prairie Moon Nursery, but they have a really exhaustive catalog on their website that allows you to filter a lot of different things, gives you a lot of cultural information, germination requirements. Um, and then I'm gonna walk you through this um, Federal Highway Administration Eco-Regional Revegetation Application Tool. I know Sarah talked about it in the past, but I also just wanna give you a couple images of how it works. So this is a tool, it's a, basically a database of native species in, that occur in the United States. There are a few naturalized species in there as well. And there's this exhaustive amount of information about each species in there that you can then filter. Um, and they've also categorized these different workhorse species for pollinators or for um, just other kinds of vegetation projects. Um, this is what it might look like if you were to select like one of these eco regions. So on the map, you select your ecoregion here. I've selected North Central Hardwood Forest. Um, and then it'll give you the option. You can either view all the plants in the browser or you can download the species. Um, and if, it, if you're at all comfortable with Excel, I would recommend downloading them. It can get a little clunky on the website itself um, because there's just so many species to deal with. So I recommend downloading the list. And then I know this is tiny, <laughs> but I just wanna, highlight a couple of different uh, fields that then you can go and filter and really design a specialized mix. So you can filter by the pollinator value that's available. Um, if you're trying to design a mix specifically for bumblebees, if you have rusty patch bumblebee in your area, you can filter for best bumblebee plants. Um, maybe you are a fruit farmer and you really want hummingbirds to eat your spotted wing or safwa. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things that I sometimes encounter. Um, you can filter for hummingbird specific plants. So you can really tailor your seed mix to specific species that are gonna help you achieve your, your goals. So that's the ERA tool. I highly encourage you get familiar with it. So now I want to, <laughs> um, let's say you, you've created this list of desirable species that you want in your mix. Um, now you have to figure out, you know, how much do I want of each species? What, what volume should I be ordering? Um, and it used to be that, that people really just talked about pounds per acre of each species. Um, but now as we've been designing more and more complex and diverse mixes, we really needed to shift to speaking only about, well, at least initially in the design process, about seeds per square foot, because it's something you can kind of visualize in a really easy, you know, foot by foot, square foot, um, how many seeds are actually landing in that area. And this really matters because we're putting this diversity of flowers, this, the seed size is really different. Here's just two examples of great blue lobelia versus cup plant. Um, you know, if we were to put a pound down of each, we'd end up with nearly 200 seeds of great blue lobelia and, you know, half a seed per square foot of cup plant. So just a pound is not a pound. We have to be thinking about seeds per square foot. Um, this is, a lot of people will ask me like, how do you decide on the rate of each species? This is kind of my go-to table for deciding some of those things, at least a, as a starting point. Um, 
I'll walk you through this if you've never seen it before. This is from the Tallgrass Prairie Center. Um, on the left, you have these different plant guilds or functional groups, uh, like the cool season grasses, the warm season grasses, the things that I outlined in the previous slide. And then there's sort of two column categories. There's the number of species, and that's broken down by your soil moisture types. Um, and so you can see down at the bottom, um, there's they range in 42 seeds per square foot to 55. And then you, there's sort of variation in the in the functional group um, species richness, right? And then there's that second area on the right, those columns, the seeding rates based on seeds per square foot of each one of those um, cool season, you know, all the different functional groups. So this is really like a goal for, and it's really just minimums. You can definitely seed at higher rates, add more diversity, that's, that's encouraged. Um, but this is a good baseline. A couple additional thoughts, um, because it, this takes a little nuance. This is sort of where the art of <laughs> seed mix design comes in to, and that you learn over time. Um, but limit the, those annuals and biennials. They do provide instant gratification for the first couple of years, um, but you don't need so many of them. They can really dominate. Um, and what you really need are, you need a little bit of those that will love that initial disturbance after seeding, but you need some long-lived perennials that are gonna show up in years three through 50, right? That are gonna stay there and create that foundation of the plant community. So don't go too heavy on the annuals and biennials. Get to know the species kind of germination rates. That might help you think about when to seed, what to expect in years one through five. Um, don't, you know, be aware of some of the really aggressive species like big blue stem Indian grass. A lot of the sunflowers are pretty aggressive. Cut plant for sure is aggressive. And so as well, bergamot. So when I'm um, checking mixes or reviewing mixes, I like to see no more than 0.1 seeds per square foot of cup plant or it will, um, and same with wild bergamot, no more than four seeds per square foot. Because what you can see on the left here is, you know, this is really impressive amount of bergamot um, when you have it higher than four seeds per square foot. But then you have to wonder, you know, when it's not in bloom, what else is going on there? It's basically like a bergamot crop. Um, so tons of nectar there if you're, flying and you prefer wild bergamot, but if you're um, associated with other plants, you know, this is not going to be a habitat for you. So be careful about some of those aggressive species. They uh, establish well and then they kind of promote themselves over time. So limit those. Um, seed cost, of course, is going to be a, a factor that you have to reckon with with all these different species. Um, and because seed cost is a, is a factor and because you're going to try to add diversity, right? Um, you may need to do multiple seeding events over time. Research shows that multiple seeding events over time gets prairies to approximate something that looks more like a remnant prairie um, than, than a restoration. So consider that if budget is sort of a limitation. Another thing to um, consider would be adding actual rootstock or transplants um, for the really conservative species that are difficult to get going from seed. Um, and when you do that, you might want to put it in a sort of uh, clustered area so that you can monitor it and see how they're doing. Uh, you want to get a certain population size to make sure that it's going to be sustainable. Um, there's a short list of species I pulled together here that we consider restoration conservative species. Um, some of them, you know, some, there's a lot of variation here. These are species that you might consider because either the seed is really uh, expensive or once you put that seed down, you don't see any individuals come up um, in the restoration planting. So lead plant would be an example of that where seed is actually relatively easy to produce and you can put the seed in seed mixes um, for relatively low cost, but then almost nobody sees it show up in their plantings. Um, and so lead plant might be one that you would consider adding in as a plug. Um, same with prairie violets. You know, these are all just a few examples. There are many other conservative species um, that you might consider doing this. Um, I like to talk a little bit about the economics of this diversity because it helps people, especially if you're 
a consultant and you're working with a landowner who just doesn't understand why species, native species are so expensive. Um, so these are kind of talking points for you um, to, to borrow. You know, there are factors that cause seed to be inexpensive. It's a, in this, a short life cycle. They're really easy to germinate. Um, basically species like this great St. John's wort on the top where all the seed is just in this little cup that's upright. As soon as I dump it into my hand, it's basically clean, chaff-free, hard seed, thousands of seed, right? I mean, this is like typical. The species that behave in this way are always gonna be very available commercially. <laughs> and they're probably gonna dominate our restorations. Whereas seeds that are more expensive are more expensive because the species is rare to begin with. So we don't have a good um, source population for them. The, they usually have to be hand harvested. They're odd shaped like that pasque flower. Um, they have difficult germination requirements. They, they have seed pests that show up at the last minute. Um, so these are some of the reasons. And, and you know, when a species is either expensive or not expensive, it really doesn't equate to what its um, ecological value is. So we know there are a lot of species that are relatively cheap that do um, really bring in a lot of diversity of pollinators and they're really important. Um, so just a few talking points for you. Um, it is worth saying, you know, as a general rule, as you add diversity to a planting, it does go up in cost. So you can get a pretty economical mix for, you know, 100 to $250. Um, as soon as you start adding a few species that are a little higher value, like some of the milkweeds, you start to get into a little higher uh, cost category per acre. And then if you want to build a really high quality mix that really you only have to do once or it requires less maintenance in the long term, um, it might be worth it to really invest in that seed mix to begin with. Um, in this little picture here, it's, it may not look as showy as the first two photos, um, but in this little one or two square foot area, there's like seven different plant families represented here. So like that's the recipe for resilient um, habitat that's really protecting a lot of pollinators. So that upfront cost may really pay off. I am, imagine that economical mix where it's mostly Monarda, you know, that, that might be a good solution for a five-year project, but that might have to just, you might just have to start over eventually um, if you want to bring in more diversity. So consider um, diversity and the higher upfront cost as maybe a trade-off for long-term management cost down the road. Hey, Karen, Lori here. There's lots of interest in your talk. The questions are rolling in. Just yeah. let me know. Okay, I'll skip through a few of these. The main point here is that um, I just made this demonstration mix showing that adding species diversity doesn't mean that you have to add cost. I made a mix with 30 species to meet a certain standard and a mix with 15 species to meet that same standard. They both came out to be the same cost per acre. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to go through this whole example, but these are some of the questions that I would ask myself when I see a mix, right? So there's these different species. I don't exactly know what their relationship is to each other. So I ask myself these different questions. How many are there? What's that ratio? Is it really just by weight? It looks like it's 50-50% grasses to forbs, but if you look at it by seeds per square foot, it's in fact a 75 to 25% ratio. Um, how many total seeds per square foot? 35. Are there three, at least three species blooming in each season? We've got spring, summer, fall. Yes, there are some, but are the quantities sufficient? So look at this golden alexanders down there on the bottom. Really low seeding rate for golden alexanders. So is that really going to persist over time or provide a lot of pollinator benefit? Are there host plants for butterflies if that's a goal? Um, at least there are none for monarchs. Um, there's seven plant families here. How many annuals and biennials? This mix is really dominated by the annuals and biennials. So what's going to be left when those start to fade out? Um, are these species appropriate? There's one in here I wanted to go through as an example, landsleaf coreopsis. Um, maybe not that appropriate for a lot of sites in Minnesota. Um, I know I'm going through this quickly, but I just want to get to a few questions before we get to the next presenter. Um, 
Are any species dominated in the mix? Yeah, two of the species make up 40% of the forbs. And those two species are biennials. Um, soil moisture types, that's a little nuanced, but yeah, in this particular case, it looks a little mismatched. Cost, it was about 200, so really affordable. Here's another mix. I just, here are all the kind of answers to my questions. Obviously there's a lot more um, species present. The forb ratio is a little different. Um, there's a lot higher seeds per square foot. It's a higher seeding rate. There's a lot of milkweed host plants. Um, there's a little bit better balance generally. And you know, all of this kind of comes at a cost. So those are two, oops, two things that I would note about this mix. It's a good mix, but it has um, a certain forb to grass ratio that may or may not meet certain standards that you have to operate in. Um, and it's a cost, you know, it's a higher cost. So that's something to consider when you're evaluating a mix. And then the, there's this inevitable thing that happens. You, you design this beautiful mix and then you end up having to actually swap out species because, um, because they're not available at the time. Um, and so then you have to ask yourself this other series of questions. You know, what is an appropriate swap? Um, does it meet the same goals? Is this blooming at the same time? Does it have a similar plant family? Is it gonna serve the pollinators in the same way? Is it appropriate for the site? Um, it's just a lot of different questions. It's a, it can be a long process to build a custom mix and really get it done right. Um, just be prepared for these different um, substitutions. They will happen and you know substitutions are not all equal. Uh, I'll leave you with just a reminder that so many of our resources on our website, plant lists, et cetera, um, are available for free as downloadable PDFs to help you with your restoration projects. So go there, explore, um, share widely. Um, I'm gonna, I just stole this slide from a previous presentation because I just wanna highlight again, how many useful resources there are for species selection from Heather Holm. Um, you can find those on her website. Um, and then just a brief plug here that some of you may be familiar with the Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources state seed mixes. Um, there are so many mixes available there that provide specs for you and they're for all these different conservation practices. They're customized by the region of the state. And I just want you to know that we're going through this major kind of revision process and we're bringing in a lot of stakeholders who might be familiar with these mixes, might wanna see some improvements. Um, if you feel like you are one of those stakeholders that has a lot of opinions about what these mixes should look like, um, reach out to me and I can get you kind of involved. Um, well, that's a good segue, Karen, into our um, first question, which actually a lot of people asked and it has to do with climate change pressures and thoughts on designing seed mixes to facilitate the migration of plant species from the south north, basically. Yeah, I get that question kind of a lot and it's, it's not, um, I don't think there's a general rule for that you could apply to all species. Um, yes, generally we might get a little wetter in parts of our state. Um, we might get a little warmer. Um, I'm still, generally speaking, trying to source seed, like the seed origins, the genetic origins um, from no more than 250 miles away. But when those species those sources are not available. Um, and maybe there's uh, an origin from Kitson County, which is far northwestern Minnesota versus sort of southern Iowa. I might go with the genetic origins of southern Iowa instead. Um, and that's an, it's kind of a decision I'm making kind of for climate resilience. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend introducing species that originate in Iowa, but don't naturally occur in Minnesota. Um, so that, that's just sort of my stance. And I don't know, I'm sure other practitioners do other things, <laughs> but that's and basically Karen, what I recommend. Karen, where does um, Canada fit into the category for plant resources and seeds? Is that considered in the, um, for Xerxes materials, for instance, would that be in the I forget what you call it, Upper Peninsula or Great so, Lakes. So yeah, we have these different regions. One is the Great Lakes region. That's the region I'm most familiar with because that's the region I'm located in. 
Um, we do have a few others that do extend into Canada. I'm not as familiar with those. One of my colleagues, Stephanie Frischi, she frequently works in Canada with, um, with um, growers there, for, like oats growers, and she's doing a lot of cool restoration projects up there. Um, I'd be happy to connect a Canadian with her <laughs> to advise on sourcing um, seeds as well as like species that would be most appropriate for a mix. Well, I'm going to send the rest of these questions to you, Karen, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Um, we'll get to our, our next speaker, which is Ryan from the Integrated Pest Management Institute of America. Um, your talk was amazing. I think I could watch that over about a half a dozen times. There's a lot of content there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody, if you have additional questions, please do reach out. Um, uh, you might have picked up, it's one of my favorite topics to talk about, so um, uh, <laughs> keep in touch. Great, thank you, Karen. Thank you, everybody.